Good evening. The school board meeting of Tuesday, October 11, 1994 is now called to order. The first item on the agenda is adjustments to agenda. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? No? Seeing none, move on to approval of September 13, 1994 school board minutes. Anybody have any corrections, Beth? Um, page 60 at the top, um, it says Ann Chapman made a motion, second by Charles, Charles Greer. I think I made the motion, Connie. Uh, what, what number please? Um, it's at the top of page 60, mm -hmm. item number 8B. Um, okay, good. Any others? Okay, the minutes stand approved as corrected. Uh, the next item is comments by high school representative. Hello. Hi. The student council held a half day retreat about two weeks ago. We spent much of the time in small groups talking about concerns and ideas for the coming year and ended, with a long ended up with a long list of things we'd like to do this year. We finally decided to pick two topics to focus, on, to focus all our energy on rather than trying to spread ourselves out too thin. Those two topics are school spirit and student rights and responsibilities. We also held class meetings last week, the first time our new officers have had a chance to address the student body. At that time, Corey Kessler and John Workman talked to everyone about sponsoring four needy families at Thanksgiving, um, which seems to be becoming an annual tradition. Um, class meetings, classes have started fundraising. The seniors were especially successful. Um, attendance at their dance a couple weeks ago was at a record high. Any questions, comments? No? Thank you very much. Now we have the middle school representatives here tonight. Hello everybody. Thank you for letting us join you tonight. My name is Amy Fairbanks. My name is Alec Michaels. This month we'll be having a dance on the 14th. Mr. Conley has requested a contribution of $1,000 towards a physical science curriculum for grades 5 through 8. We've contributed $500. This year we're doing the sweatshirt drive before Christmas. This cross-country season, many more people signed up, so an extra coach was required. The budget couldn't afford another coach, so the student council has offered to pay for her good work. Also, the fifth graders will be sending two people from each homeroom to see what it's like to be on student council, and we'll have the election in January. Thank you again, and good night. Thank you. Okay, moving on to communications. Are there any communications? Basically, I just included in your packet a couple of uh, articles that have been in the paper recently. Um, I thought uh, the one on um, that we haven't really discussed on education reformers can learn from struggles over health care was kind of interesting in the sense that it talks about uh, issues related to total quality. And we have an item on the agenda where I'll mention quality again, so I just thought you might be interested if you hadn't seen it. I did include the editorial that was in the paper, or one of them, there's been one since then in, over the weekend, on our um, student survey on drug and alcohol issues, and in case you had missed them, I just included them. Any others? Okay, moving on to the superintendent's report. And the first item is actually the middle school athletic report, and I included it in the packet, uh, but I also see that Andy Stroud is here. I believe from last month's meeting, Andy, that you were going to answer any questions or point out to the school board any of the trends that you thought would be of particular interest. Well, I think most of it is uh, self-explanatory. Uh, we do have a, a large increase of the numbers of participants um, over last year's, we've uh, um, added about another 70, 70 uh, pupils, um, athletes playing in the seventh and eighth grade uh, teams. Um, if you heard in between some of those lines with the middle school representatives here, um, they also mentioned that we had uh, a large overflow of uh, cross country runners this year. And uh, we have, the student council uh, funded an extra cross-country coach, uh, which was very, very nice of them. Uh, Teresa Lemansky was added with Joe Doan. They had over 60 kids come out for cross-country this year. 
And Mr. Doan for the last three or four years has been very gracious and, and has been able to handle those numbers, but um, his hair is starting to fall out and uh, we all know that uh, we had to lend him a little hand. So um, they came up and uh, came up with about $800 to help uh, Ms. Lemansky uh, with that program. We will be coming to the um, Athletic Fee Committee this year and requesting that as a, as a regular stipend position for possibly next year. But through the, through the report, I think everything has uh, worked out very well. Um, we actually had a decrease in, in the, ex the expense of, of the programs. Um, since we did uh, do a straight line from last year and the increase of number of kids, it, it dropped to $88 a, a pupil this year. And last year it was $97 a pupil. Um, so it, it, it really it works out very well, very inexpensive. Uh, thing for the kids to have uh, really a, a good feeling and a, and a good program for them. Any yeah. Questions? yeah. Um, you mentioned the sixth graders can participate in cross country and track. Mm -hmm. Is that both girls and boys? Yes, yes it is. And the large cross country group you mentioned is also both girls and boys? Right, yeah. The, uh, I think we have like 25 sixth graders in the, in the cross country. Um, they do not count in the, in the final meet but they do run in practices and in some of the meets. And in indoor track um, is where there, was, there is a separate uh, time for them to be able to run. And also the outdoor track, they do run an outdoor track also. Yeah. What's the reason for the uh, cost decrease from last year? Decrease is mainly because of the numbers. You know, our, numbers our numbers are up. We had, uh, last year we had 489 students and we, We've increased that 64, uh, so it goes up to five, 553. Uh, this fall we had approximately 60, 60 percent. This fall of, of people participating in the different activities, so we'll see another increase coming up through this year also. Plus, we've got a very large eighth grade class, and a lot of them participate in the activities. I'm probably going to open a can of worms, but. Last year, we had a problem with process and additional funding for an additional coach. Was there a process used this year to come up with the additional money for the cross-country coach? The, uh, what, what we did two years ago when we added indoor track, uh, indoor track was added as like a club activity where the coaches were not, mm. were not paid by the school district. Um, and we used the middle, the student council used those funds at that time. And then that year we came in to the athletic fee committee and we said, this is what um, has been happening. This is a new program that we would, would like to get into. And so the athletic fee committee uh, granted that to us. Um, this year with the numbers that, that Mr. Doan had and the, and over the last four years, he has, a, ha, has had a very large number. Um, we figured that we would look at this year and see what happened, and, and we had our numbers again. Um, and it's really too late to go to the Athletic Feed Committee because everything's been budgeted. So we will be coming uh, this year to the meeting and requesting another coach for that. Last year, um, what happened was during the B basketball season, we had such a large income, a large influx of kids coming in that we needed extra help up and beyond the funded position that we had, which was that B coach. We already had that B coach, but we had, I believe it was like 36 extra kids for a position that usually handles about 15. So that's, that's when we came to you last, last winter, I believe. And we had that extra money that, that we did have there if we needed, so. This year, it, right now, it's just the, right now, it's just the, uh, the cross country. Okay. This, this had the approval of your principal, building principal, yes. this process. Yes. I want to make sure there was a process there and that the coaches didn't go out and hire a coach and then no. go out and find the funding because this is what happened with soccer last year in the no. high school. No, what, what happened is that, is that uh, Ms. Hutton and I sat down and discussed the problem and we knew that this problem possibly would be coming up. We, uh, we researched all possibilities. I went to, uh, to Scott and talked to him about uh, if there would be extra monies anywhere. We went 
um, to the track boosters and look for extra money there, and there was nothing there. And then we went and fell back onto the, the student council, which I went and presented our plan to them with the thought that we would go to the athletic uh, fee committee next year, or this year, coming year, and uh, request that we need an added position for next year. Is that correct? Um, Mr. Stroud, your memory is impeccable. Good job. Um, that's, that's correct. I think one of the reasons, too, Charlie, that we handled that way is that we weren't trying to add a team or anything. We were trying to deal with the numbers of a team that we already had established. We have just one cross-country team. And um, so when we looked at it in comparison to some of the things that had happened in other schools at other times when other teams were formed, and when we came last winter to you for another team situation um, and reallocating some of our money we already had, we knew at this point we had no money in the budget and we were dealing with a situation of students who had already come out for a team and it was still going to be the only team um, and we weren't going to be adding another cross-country team, just trying to help manage all the students who were running. So that's why we followed that procedure. And as Andy has said, it's a procedure we've used in our track program before. And we certainly will be coming to the Athletic Fee Committee this year to talk about. We now have data over several years of having a large number of students come out for cross country in the fall. And we'll be making a recommendation of the best way to handle that. Not, not to pick on this situation, but I think Charlie does raise a, a point that we need to still hone in on in, in the whole school system. Um, we still seem to have a gray area about who should be hiring coaches and, and, and that kind of matter, whether, whether it's a you know, booster club or the student council or whoever, where those funds are coming from. I, I think that's still something that we need to clarify as a board. But anyway, this is fine. <laughs> I'm glad the kids are so interested, and you should tell Joe Doan that you know he does such a good job of recruiting those those sixth graders. That <laughs> I he has he's only learn to, to blame. I, I told him he's going to learn to cut cut those down a little bit if we could not uh, <laughs> fund uh, Miss Lemansky's position there, because uh, you know the kids just just love coming out and working with them, and it's a great opportunity for that sixth grade group, um, and and they're doing very very well this year too. Yeah, very enthusiastic. Yeah, that's for sure. Any, Any other questions? questions? Sure. Just one. Uh, your report, since this is your second year doing this, is, is very good. I would only add one, one line to that, or one column, and that would be the number of staff positions for each sport so that we have some idea. Okay. See, with the high school, we know that it's yep. boys basketball or it's boys JV or it's girls, so we know what number of coaches. But in this case, where it covers all boys soccer, which is two grades, all girls soccer, which is two grades. Okay. Yep. It just helps us understand the cost. Mm -hmm. You know, when you see a 3,900 figure for coaching, and when you really look at girls' basketball, it really involves more than one team. But if you're thinking on a high school level, of, huh. that could be varsity or JV. That's the only thing I would okay. add. Okay. Sounds fair to me. Okay. Thanks, Thank Andy. you very much. Thank you, Andy. Um, next item is the update on student survey on drug and alcohol use. It, we have had a um, couple of meetings, frankly, since then, um, various types of things. I did make note in your board packet, the agenda notes about a meeting that we had last week with representatives of the town council as well as uh, school people. And most importantly, I think we had a number of youngsters come with uh, our high school administration. Um, and although I think the discussion was fairly general in nature, it was particularly important for us to begin that process of having meetings with interested community groups and the students directly there. Uh, so I really, really appreciate and thank the high school administration and the students for coming. Uh, it's clear that we will be having ongoing meetings, and at last uh, month's, um, in September, I mentioned that we were going to have a uh, kind of a representative group from a number of community uh, organizations, including the police, town council, school board, um, obviously school people, and we are certainly going to add student representation after that step. Um, I think the date I had mentioned last month was November 9th, which turns out to be the same night that the community coalition is meeting. It's an extremely important part of this effort 
And so we have changed that meeting to the following Wednesday, which is November 16th at 7 o'clock at 1226. And I will be sending out some notices, and I understand from talking with our police chief that he will be also notifying people. So that's an ongoing issue. Um, and I think that pretty well summarizes that item, unless you have some people who weren't at that meeting, if they had any questions. Well, and I'd, I'd just like to add that the uh, coalition is meeting tomorrow night. Uh, I've neglected to bring the time with me. Does anybody know? I think it's 7.30. 7.30, and where is it? 12.26. And in fact, I think those the high school students who were at our meeting the other day are going to attend and be you know, willing to talk to parents um, about their perspectives on this issue. And I, I just have to say, they were incredibly articulate, and they were certainly the missing link um, that we that we didn't have in this discussion. So I would um, encourage everybody to go to that meeting. It should be very interesting. Any questions? Just a question on the um, the committee that's been meeting that involves the town, mm -hmm. et cetera. Did you did you discuss at that meeting the police? proposed policy uh, yeah I had discussed that with we had some questions right I had discussed the uh, that issue or er, actually earlier with our police chief um, and the clarification still hasn't sifted into uh, an absolute um, written revision uh, it was very clear that the piece that was in his original draft policy which we discussed of course in a, in a board workshop this uh, in August uh, and there was mention of the locker searches, which certainly did kind of come across, I think, in the paper a little differently mm. from what we had, in, in fact, discussed. You may recall that we had an incident in the middle school last year, and the police suggested um, to us as school people that they could uh, perhaps arrange for some kind of locker search for items, contraband items that might, in fact, be in lockers. Uh, since we didn't have a written policy explicitly spelling out how we would handle that, I said, well, let me call individual board members, which I did do to get a feeling because they were going to use police dogs. And police dogs is a, uh, an issue that you do need to spell out what is the policy for a particular school district. We had no difficulty whatsoever in agreeing that that can be an appropriate use um, as far as lockers would be concerned, but uh, clearly we wanted to avoid any of the complications that can arise and have arisen in schools when um, police dogs have been brought in to uh, sniff children. We did not wish to get into anything remotely like that. Um, but we had no trouble with reaching agreement uh, on that issue with our police. We do have a policy in the works between the high school administration, which would then be uh, we'd, we'd consider it a school-wide policy, frankly, as far as spelling out steps. It was a police chief's concern that we could arrive at a uh, decision without that time being taken for me to try to contact individual board members. I think that was actually stated in the paper, but you had to read the whole article before you got to that point. Um, it is, uh, it's, frankly, it is a school statute that administrators are the people who are on the spot who have the power to open lockers and to um, invite, uh, under certain circumstances, a police search. Uh, we clearly want to be very clear that everybody's rights and responsibilities are protected, and we are in the process of spelling out those search and seizure issues. We, we have some sample policies that we are looking at. Uh, I would see that as one of the first things that we will put in writing when we are at this um, general meeting, just to clear that issue up. It's just interesting. The newspaper article kind of accentuated the, mm. the, the locker search more than it did the community mm. interaction and uh, awareness. Well, and and they, they, just, they followed it up then with an editorial doing the same thing. Yes. Which, which was too bad because it, that was something that obviously we had not signed off on yet. So. No, there, there's, uh, there are a number of issues that we, uh, we've had meetings, two or three meetings, as a matter of fact, between school administration, uh, including uh, some legal representation, including at one, at one time last winter, somebody from the DA's office, um, and both the police department as well as obviously the school department. We're certainly anxious to make sure that we're not violating anybody's rights as well as doing prudent things and things that will will promote a sense of safety in the school, not promote a sense of uh, uh, dis-ease. But at the same time, uh, we'll, we'll 
that's a matter of getting the exact wording down. I think we have basic agreement as to how we will handle those things. It seems as though that with the timing of the publicity and the timing of the presentation of the uh, survey, uh, that the perception might be that the, uh, the meetings that we've had with the coalition are a result of the survey, and that's not the case at all. That the meetings have been going on for months now before the, the survey came out. Uh, kind of a related uh, issue to the survey, I was wondering if the students uh, felt betrayed at all by having the results being made as public as they are mm -hmm. being under the agreement, I guess, when they took the survey that it was going to be uh, yeah, completely confidential. Well, it's certainly uh, two points there. One, the coalition. I think that has been something that is important to stress. The coalition was a community group, actually started two years ago. Uh, and in the spirit of a number of previous parent uh, and community groups uh, around similar issues, uh, and I think it really is important to note that fact. In fact, the coalition was, um, coalition representatives were part of the discussion that the school people had last year, right, Rick, in the advisability of doing some kind of survey. As far as the youngsters' feelings about that, I think that is true. I think that there was some uh, comment made. We have had some discussion with them. Of course, they are anonymous. The answers were anonymous. We have no, no, no data, no, no uh, information as to who said what. Um, and students were told that they would be used in the interest of, of uh, improving things at the school. Clearly, they didn't realize, and perhaps it's one of those issues that can sometimes crop up to beat you over the head. Once something is discussed at the board level, of course it's public information. And in fact, in many cases, um, it's arguable that once a survey is taken, once it's published, and as long as that it is in a format that does not violate confidentiality, that is no names are attached and so forth, then it becomes public information. We've had that discussion and tried to clarify that with students, and I think for the most part they understand. Uh, furthermore, much of their comment has really been, it's about time we, we started openly talking about the issues. Um, and it is somewhat unnerving to pick up the paper and think that you're being highlighted, and we all feel kind of bad about that. But we, we don't solve problems by not being open about them. The other issue that I have pointed out to people, um, I'm sure that the goals 2000 is a phrase that most parents or most people involved with school are familiar with. It's both a national effort and a state effort. Goals 2000, um, both from the previous Republican administration, the current Democratic, I mean, it's kind of an ongoing thing. Neither one has dropped it, so I'm assuming that it will continue regardless of what the next administration may be. And one of those goals is to have a safe, uh, drug-free, violence-free setting for our schools. And one of their recommendations is to have surveys of student use, what in fact are kids actually doing. Uh, and the questions, uh, suggested questions, are very similar uh, to the ones that our, um, our source use. So uh, I, get, I see it all as a, an attempt to get a, really define the problem. What are we facing? What are the dimensions? and then to look at a community-wide um, discussion and hopefully some solution. Perhaps Rick would like to address that issue. Just to clarify, I think the, the comment you made about the kids being upset about that, I think that was, uh, as Connie alluded to, uh, the difference between confidentiality and, and anonymity in which we didn't use names. And I'll be very honest with you, when we um, talked about having the survey, the idea of the coalition and having this, this type of uh, format at the end was not uh, part of that package. It was more to get information for us as a school, share that with the community and the parents, and have the parents, do, we had initially had planned to have the parents do a survey and then try to compare what, what parents perceived and what the students were telling us. When we uh, met with the coalition and, and asked for their assistance, and, and Mrs. Goldman and I met with uh, members from day one, we expanded that to talk, it, talk to it uh, over a 6 through 12 issue. That's when it became more of a system-wide issue as, as opposed to just a high school uh, situation. I did speak with approximately 100 students the following day after the survey was in the paper. I sat in Andrea Kerr's health classes and we discussed the whole issue. And I think they realized where 
the school was coming from, and my issues were concerned about the welfare and safety of the students during the school day, the six and a half hours that they, that they are there. And when I see numbers in a survey that indicate you know, students medicating themselves during the school day, that was my primary concern, and we needed to work with parents to talk about the whole picture, but that was my primary focus at that point. And I think the students understood that, and I think that the point of having a safe uh, environment for these students so when they come to school, the, uh, the temptations and, the, and the, the concerns for drugs and alcohol, we're trying to uh, really put a, put a stop to that and, and students feel comfortable coming to school knowing that, that that issue is not present. We have a long way to go, but I also want to mention that I've had calls from other school systems who since that survey are now pursuing similar, similar things. We may, be, may have been the, the start of something that I can see if we do this regionally or within the greater Portland area schools talking with schools as well as parents and communities. This could be the start of something very positive, not just in Cape Elizabeth. So I'd like to say, say we've taken kind of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, initial uh, uh, stance and now other, other, some other communities are following. And they've been very supportive of the results that they've read about and, and, uh, and are inquiring about their own communities and doing something very similar. So you'll be reading about, other, as I wrote to one, I said it'd be nice to see some other school systems in the press other than Cape Elizabeth. Uh, so, but I just want you to know, I think it's become a very positive uh, force in the high school, not one that initially was very resistant and, and uh, concerned about the results. Yeah, I think one of the keys to that is including the students in the discussion because obviously they, to some extent, some of them have probably felt like they're all being tarred with one brush and that there'll be all kinds of punitive action taken. That's why it is important to include them. And they're kind of a reality check about what's really going on out there. They're real kids we're talking about. So. I, th I think the whole student issue about the, the results being uh, released was it wasn't re the communication and the timeline of re it wasn't released to them first. So it was like they were betrayed because we didn't get to them until after. In most surveys, you probably would, would get back to your, 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 the people involved in the survey before it became a public knowledge. But I, th I think it was just a matter of timing and communication because you know, in talking to a lot of those students that participated in that's where they felt betrayed. You know, it was released to the community and the press before they even knew what the results were themselves, mm -hmm. even though they were, they were aware. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And another, uh, just a little uh, uh, fast to add to this, the, the, uh, the current junior class, because of uh, our attempts to have, it, have the survey completed during the soft, uh, sophomore retreat day, we uh, ran out of time and did not survey those students. They have asked for Mrs. Kerr in an informal way to go back and do this, and complete the survey with them. They're just interested in, to see how they, uh, how students will respond to that. So it's generated more dialogue within the school itself as well as, again, being out in the press. So I think it's, it's generated some real positive things. And you're, uh, you're absolutely right, Mr. Greer, as far as uh, the timing was not uh, conducive for us to get that information out when, when the uh, uh, press uh, got hold of it. So any other questions or comments? Because I personally got confronted the next day by my, my uh, children's friends that, you know, you broke confidentiality, blah, 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 and I explained the process. I think after explaining it, they, and then also Mr. Diffuse go back to me that he had gotten to some of those students through some of these classes mm -hmm. to explain, you know, the survey, et cetera. I think that's where they were left out a little. Mm -hmm. They were participants, yet they were never communicated back in a timely fashion. And suddenly it's out in the press. Well, I, I think that's been a problem with our whole process mm. up until uh, Rick brought the students the other day. And it, it did just, it just added that perspective that, that we really needed. Um, they, won't be, they won't be left out of the process anymore no. because <laughs> we're certainly not going to solve this problem without, without them. I mean, if, we're just, if we think we can just impose some rules and everything's going to be wonderful, we're, we're really wrong. They probably have more and better ideas on how to resolve this issue than, than we do. So. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Um, okay, moving on. The next issue is an update from the Technology Committee. We have a board member, Keith Witherell, who has been part of that, as well as a number of staff people here tonight. I see we have at least, I think we have three. They did include our, for your, in your package, you have a little summary, but uh, I think everybody has a chance and we'll introduce them. 
Mr. Gary Lenoy, who is the chair of our technology department, formerly known as our, oh gosh, formerly what? Industrial, Industrial arts, arts and various other kinds of things. And Betsy Nelson, who is our computer specialist. And Joyce Bell, who is our librarian. And they have been working together as a team. Uh, they started during the budget process last year. You saw a proposal from them. Uh, we made some changes. Um, and then, of course, our K-12 committee, vision committee that is meeting. And why don't we start with the staff and let you go right ahead and explain where we're at. OK. Our, our purpose here tonight is, is twofold. First, to talk about the, the K-12 technology steering committee and give you some information about that, and then to talk about an in-service course that we're going to be delivering to, for the high school staff. <clears throat> the Technology Steering Committee was formed last spring uh, under the direction of, of Dr. Goldman and we, uh, an outside consultant from the uh, Maine Center for Educational Services. Um, the person we started with is not the person we have now because of a job change, but we still have uh, some help there. Um, Mrs. Goldman felt that we, we needed some outside assistance to help our system get on track. Last spring's major task was putting the committee together, and we put together a committee we think with broad representation, and we have approximately 12 people that should be coming to the, the meetings, um, a delegate and an alternate for most groups. We obviously don't have a, an alternate superintendent, but for most of those, <laughs> we have, we have uh, two people. Um, one administrator, on representing all three administrators, we have uh, teachers from each one of the, the three clusters and schools. Um, at one of our more recent meetings, our facilitator wanted to clarify what our purpose was because we were getting some uh, rumors and, and ideas that maybe we were supposed to be approving software and different things like that, and that, that wasn't really our vision of this committee. So the, the little middle section talks about the vision, um, developing the purpose, developing a systemic vision, laying out a five-year game plan, um, acting as a catalyst to help those things in our system, defining the general direction of the, the K-12 technology curriculum, and maybe, maybe we need to say the word computer in there someplace too, computer technology or technology, uh, but they're, they're kind of related. Some people like the broad general term technology, some people like to have the computer in there and define expectations of technologies needed to manage the business of the schools. We've met for a full day workshop over the summer and a lot of the information I've given you came from that full day workshop. We are putting together um, a vision, or a mission and a vision. We're not sure what mission and vision is, but we're modeling after what you people have done for the school system. And we've put together a draft of our mission statement right now, even though in some of the notes it's called vision. So hopefully we haven't confused you. We've got some ideas about vision statements, but they're in a real rough form, so I didn't, I didn't feel like they were, uh, we should give those to you yet. We'll give all of this draft material to you as it, as it becomes available. So that's, that's what the, the K-12 committee's all about. And after we have our mission and vision done, is the task is to put together a plan, three-year plan, five-year plan, and come to you with that as to where technology is going in the, in the Cape Elizabeth schools. Do I leave anything else? Part two talks about an, an in-service course that we proposed and is going to happen for our high school staff, uh, giving you the outline of the course. And you can see the date that we're going to start is October 19th. We're offering it both on the, in the PC lab, uh, which we have on the main floor of the high school, and, and the Mac lab, which is down in uh, the technology wing, um, way down in the, in the lower part of the high school. We've got approximately eight to 10 people signed up for the whole sections of the class. And we've offered different, if teachers want to come in for individual sessions, then they can come in for just those individual sessions as well. I think we're going to see through the course approximately uh, 29, 30 faculty members in the high school. So we'll see a high percentage of the faculty members. And, uh, that's, that's where we're headed. Any questions? 
<laughs> Charlie. You have a time frame for your technology steering committee, don't you? A tentative time frame? Yes, we wanted to have something to present to you people before the budget cycle begins. And we have a couple of board members on that committee too, so the people are being represented. Um, I just had a question. This course looks great. Um, was it just offered to high school staff because that's all the space you had available, or was that a um, just a decision made? For right now, this first time, I think it's going to be just high school staff. And whether we do it again in the spring, uh, later in the year, then we might open it up uh, system-wide. But right now, just high school staff because of numbers, basically. Yeah, it looks like a great course. Um, really bring people up to speed in a lot of areas. Thank you. So, I was just thinking, I have, we have two people there. Uh, perhaps each, uh, Betsy and, and uh, Trish, you can give us a little sense of what your own specialties. I think everybody in the board probably knows what some of the changes that have happened in the library over the last four years. I'm not sure if everybody's up to speed. And also, Betsy has been our uh, business ed teacher, and this year, for the first time, is a full-time computer uh, teacher. So uh, perhaps we could hear a few words from each of you, or? Um, the uh, database searching will be, um, will include the resources we have available in our library as well as resources available outside the library. They'll be learning about the magazine and newspaper databases that we have that are CD-ROM products and the card catalog. And then another week, they'll learn about Ursus, the university's card catalog, and all of the resources available through that. I'll have to limit it because there's so many available. I'll have to sort of limit it to a few key things. The internet will be taught by, we hope, a university professor, um, someone who's working with it every day. Gary and I and Betsy don't work with the internet every day, so we have some other people, we hope, who can come in and provide that for us. Um, email, Gary and Betsy and I will each introduce um, a database that we're working with, uh, America Online, CompuServe, MeLink. So that's sort of the telecommunications and online stuff that we'll be doing. Questions about any of that? Okay. I'm hand over next. I'm not sure if you want an explanation of the coursework or more of an explanation of what's going on in the computer lab, but um, probably our main problem and one issue that you raised was the accessibility of the numbers of computers that we have, and we do have to limit the numbers of people. Gary only has eight Macs downstairs, and in a course like this, everyone has to be at their own computer. And that's a problem with a lot of the courses that we're offering in the day division, the uh, high school as well. Unfortunately, we're turning away other teachers who want to come into the lab with their classrooms, but because there's a class already in there, they don't have access. And you know, we had a frustrated English teacher that left today because she just can't get up and have her kids do some writing or into Gary's room either because we're using them. So we need to find some way to get another circle of computers out there to be accessible to all kids. And I think we're going to raise that issue with some of the things that we're going to request for next year's budget in terms of computer access. We're currently offering courses in keyboarding and word processing and an introduction to computers course, which Gary and I are both teaching the same period, but on different platforms. I'm teaching on the PC and he on the Mac. And uh, trying to share some of those resources. We recently had groups combined for guest visits and field trips, and we're trying to coordinate some of our projects and requirements for those courses, too. And that's about where it stands. Well, I just want to say that there's been some real progress made in high school in the last um, three or four years, uh, and obviously some of what's happening in the wiring capacity and the um, building renovation in the other two buildings, clearly this whole business of, of linking and connecting. Um, I hate to to make any suggestion that sounds like more work, but let's hope that, you know, there are some grants floating around out there. You know, we keep picking up the paper. I know we've tried for some of them, and 
um, but uh, hopefully we'll keep, keep at that, anything that I can do to help. I would like to compliment all of those who have been in the, in the committee. I haven't made all the meetings, I'm sorry to say, but my heart's in the right place, even if my feet aren't always. Uh, we were speaking of students earlier. I was just blown away with students uh, on that technology committee. That is really, that is some contribution that they are making. Uh, and I would invite any of the board members to um, take a look at when the meetings are, call my office, find out, or call Gary to find out when the next meeting, because I think that they add a tremendous amount. Um, the mission statement that is here is one, I happen to be present when there was a lot of discussion of that. Each word has been weighed. Um, and I think has, has a depth of meaning, um, uh, perhaps still to be argued, but it seems to me that it's come a long way from what it was. And I think probably what's happening, we're kind of building the airplane while we're flying it, but the staff development going on in the high school, the staff development that has also gone on at the middle school and at the Pond Cove level, in spite of all of our problems, has sharpened staff awareness. Uh, we are facing a crisis in what kind of machinery we have. I mean, the hardware is a crisis. Uh, and we're just going to have to find some solution to these things. But in the meantime, we have a lot of enthusiastic folks out there. I just got my modem <laughs> just last Thursday. And I hate to tell you all the mistakes I've made so far. But so far, it's been free because I'm on a free line. So it's, it's not costing the system anything to me to make those mistakes. But it is absolutely addictive, isn't it, when you get into online and, and start reading all the stuff that you can get hold of. Um, anyway. It's as bad as TV. You have to limit the amount yeah. of views that kids have on it. It's true. Uh, there's another thing that uh, Gary has done, too. In addition to the district-wide committee, we've set up on, uh, I understand there are com uh, computer committees in each building who are in touch with the, their key people on the district-wide committee, too. So there's an attempt to do some mm. broad communication here among all the faculty, because there are only three faculty on the committee. We wanted to somehow try to include everybody. Did you want to add to that? Well, I, just wanted, I just wanted to add that our next committee meeting is Monday the 17th. Uh, 2 p.m. in my room. The high school library is being used for other meetings that day. Um, and one last bit of information, because the Pond Cove and middle schools are in a state of disarray, the, their in-service course is going to be held at the high school in, in the little Mac lab that we have. So high, uh, Pond Cove and middle school faculty will be, will be using that facility. Can, can, I just want to say I'm, I'm delighted to see the word ethical in, in, in your mission statement. I think that's important. In the language arts um, committee, we've been talking about a research strand and the whole question of ethics and research and that kind of thing. And I think that's a, a word we don't see enough. So I applaud you for getting that word in there. It was the students who really opened, our, certainly my eyes, about that too, because they are really um, they have a lot to contribute in that, uh, you know, what, what that really means and so on. So fascinating stuff. We talked a lot about the plagiarism issue and how, how can you tell when someone draws from a, a, you know, a CD-ROM base or a, a catalog base, how are you going to tell with all the amount of data that's out there if you don't, if you don't stress the ethical portion of utilizing computer technology? This is interesting. There were three um, mission statements drawn up by Gary and the two students, each separately. And from that, we pulled this one mission statement, drawing aspects. And Connie was right, we weighed every word. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, it's good. It's a good piece of work. Can I, I just want to ask one, one more question. Um, do you see this committee? I'm just looking at the purpose of the committee. Do you see the, the um, building level committees kind of using you as a clearinghouse for ideas to make sure people aren't going off on some tangent in a particular school that might not be consistent with, with the goals of this committee? The, the reason I ask, just it's not a trick question, but um, I know we're, it, it's, it's great. Now we get all the team leader minutes and everything from every school. So of course, we pick up on, on things. And I, and I see at the middle school, um, there's a parent who's been coming in um, trying to get the middle school interested in internet. 
and that just seems to me, and talking about funding and things like that. Now, is that something, that kind of request by a parent or interest by a school, would that eventually funnel to you, to your committee, before anything was done to see if it's consistent with the plan? Hopefully the, the mission statement and, and the visions that we write down will be general enough and then each school will, each school's building committee will see where they fit into the, in the rather of the whole, the whole plan. So that, I don't know that, that we would approve specific curriculum or, you know, get that detailed, but hopefully we're going to provide a framework for the other schools. Okay, because I think that's something that we still, we're, we're still a little, a little bit of gray area where, you know, there are different initiatives going on and I think somehow we've got to um, get that communication clear enough that we still don't have people going off on particular tangents or um, duplicating efforts that are already underway. Right, um, right. and hopefully the communication is out there with, with set up with the, with the building committees in each, each of the three buildings. Right. We hope the word is, is getting out. Right. One of the things uh, about the committee, uh, one of our goals is to develop a five-year plan. Now, of course, we can't stop planning for the next five years when, when you're dealing with technology, so it's going to have to continually evolve and, and be revisited uh, in order to, to deal with new requests and new technologies as they appear. In order to look at things from a system-wide approach, I think you, this is the type of committee that would have to stay in existence. Whether they met, you know, you know, monthly or they met a couple times a year, just to to be a clearinghouse for recommendations for budgetary recommendations, because that has been the problem in the past. When we get to budgetary, we had schools coming in with requests for for certain either curriculums or hardware or software that had no consistency of, of a total approach. And I, I really see this as more of a watchdog kind of clearinghouse recommendation to, to a budgetary process that's, and to keep us on task. Uh, that's what I was... Told. That's where I see it. Yeah. Whether future boards see that, I don't know. Right. Or whether this committee does, <laughs> I hope they do. <laughs> well, they, they, it's perfectly possible that the your terms would expire and somebody else would come on. Yeah. It's not a life sentence. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You just have more of a vested interest. <laughs> right now, that's true. Thank you. Thank you very, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank all of you. Okay. Um, I also included on the agenda two things. The next two items are really, uh, especially for members who are new in the board this year. Um, one of our problems in boards is board business, I think, is how do we uh, really assure continuity. Many times we have projects that crop up in a year and you don't hear about them the next year, you're not exactly sure what's happened and they've been absorbed or have they been dropped. And so I want to make sure you've heard these two terms. The next one is human dynamics, which is a, um, a team building exercise. We did talk about that in our workshop in August. We did, um, in my notes on the uh, uh, administrative uh, discussions that followed the board and administrator workshop, I indicated our recommendation to you that we try to use um, this kind of approach as a uh, means for team building. Uh, and with that in mind, our recommendation was that we would use uh, the resources that are available to us to make that uh, available for all of our team leaders. That was kind of a K-12 framework that also, of course, includes uh, department chairs who are team leaders at the high school level. I have worked out an arrangement with our friends at Union, uh, Union National Semiconductor, um, and uh, they are continuing monthly presentations of the, the core four-day program in human dynamics. We have six staff members um, from uh, the middle school in Pond Cove attending a session actually uh, right now. And uh, we hope to be able to send a few more during October, no, uh, excuse me, November and December. Um, there are some other possibilities that are coming uh, up, and I'll let you know more about them. The other thing I said I have um, explored, I don't have an, a final answer on this yet, the possibility of doing a two-day kind of awareness session for parents, and it would probably be a good opportunity for school board members, where you're not necessarily working 
uh, our parents at least, are not necessarily working as part of a team, the two-day, first two-day awareness might be uh, a sufficient. It's certainly far more manageable than four days. It is hard to get the four-day training. Um, and again, for board members, uh, I do have some awareness tapes, and if you are interested, I'd be happy to sit down with you and give you about an hour's explanation just so that you know more about this. And if there are no more questions, and it's hard to ask a question about something you haven't done. Uh, however, I will tell you that we I've had a little bit of feedback from staff members that are uh, actually involved with it right now, and I haven't had a chance to really sit down and talk with them, but uh, they, they too sound as enthusiastic as you heard the administrators this summer, so well, you'll be hearing more about this. It's an excellent team building exercise. And the last piece in my list of things, a quality review. Again, I've been talking, I think, for years now about total quality. It's interesting to me see how much that is cropping up in discussions in a variety of ways. Um, what I think is happening is that people are getting much more sophisticated in how they're using the term. Uh, it's not just a series of tricks. Um, it's not just a, a way of running a meeting. It is a mindset that has to do with really asking some hard questions of ourselves. Um, this year, the USM partnership to which we belong, uh, which is, again, for those of you who are new to the board, that is a uh, group of, I think it's 17 school districts now. Nancy, do you remember? Pretty sure it's 17. Um, that have been involved now for about 10 years. Uh, working with USM on a variety of staff development, curriculum development issues. And uh, they are about to initiate a pilot on what they're calling school quality review initiative. I put some material in your packet. This particular initiative uh, is one that comes to us directly from, from the state of New York, but indirectly uh, before that from um, the, some of the work that the English school systems have been doing. Uh, they call it a quality initiative. As you look at it, it looks a, a good deal like what the high school recently went through in the accreditation visit. There's a self-study. There's a group of people who come in who check, the kind of a reality check. Is this, are you doing what you're saying you're doing? Um, they bring in, of course, representatives, not just the uh, schools, um, people working in the schools, but obviously school board, parents, and perhaps uh, community at large, many charts in there, and just the, I would call your attention at the page 18, promoting communication, it seemed to me that that was an excellent quotation. When I saw Matthew Arnold, he's a former teacher of English, um, startled me a little bit. Uh, Matthew Arnold hasn't been around for a while, but it, this is a Matthew Arnold who is His Majesty's Inspector, HMI. Uh, not the one of Dover Beach fame. At any rate, the um, I think the quote is is worth reading, perhaps, uh, if you don't mind. The quantity of work actually, should I read the whole thing? Read the, read the whole thing. Promoting communication. Although I thus press for the most unvarnished and literal reports on their schools, I can assure the teachers of them that it is from no harshness or want of sympathy towards them that I do so. No one feels more than I do how laborious is their work, how trying at times to the health and spirits, how full of difficulty even for the best. The quantity of work actually done at present by teachers is immense. The sincerity and devotedness of much of it is even affecting. They themselves will be greatest gainers by a system of reporting which clearly states what they do and what they fail to do, not one which drowns alike success and failure, the able and the inefficient, in a common flood of vague approbation. A quality review, then, is seen as a way of asking some tough questions and getting some straight answers. It's asking tough questions of ourselves, allowing other people to ask tough questions of us, and to give the best and clearest and most honest answers that we can. Uh, I have found in my work with Total Quality that that is, in fact, a spirit that can be uh, hard to understand, that criticism can feel, um, can feel harsh. It can feel like, how can, you, how can you ask that question? Because, in fact, I'm working as hard as I can. 
we've had some discussions. Uh, for instance, we went to a total quality training at Unum, and we talked about are we doing the wrong things right? Are we doing the right things wrong? Or are we doing the right things right? Um, are we aligning our curriculum so that one piece builds on another piece? And those are all terms used in total quality discussions. And so this is a kind of a piece that is coming through the schools themselves as a way to take some of those principles and make them appropriate for how we, um, how we ask ourselves questions that are essentially accountability. Very important questions and what I'm, all I'm asking of you tonight is um, any responses that you may have. Um, Nancy St. John actually attended a meeting where this was discussed and explained and I believe that we will have representatives from both, probably both Pond Cove and the middle school where the high school has recently been through an accreditation process less likely, although there's no reason why they couldn't attend the, the sessions and get more information. Um, I would like to invite, uh, have a meeting of the group we put together last year that we call the Quality Council, which is a group of school people, uh, teachers, administrators, school board members, uh, and some parents and business people from the community. Um, and make sure that they understand this initiative. Uh, we are, there's no guarantee even if we uh, apply to be considered that we will be one of the pilot sites. But at the same time, I think that it is a very logical next step given where we are and the kinds of accountability factors that a community like this holds. So I would recommend that we pursue it. What kind, well, of, um, what kind of time frame? Um, I noticed in the middle there's a schedule that's like a one week sort of a thing. But if, if a school was a pilot site, what kind of a total time frame are we talking about? Well, my understanding is that they are, uh, the university in working this through is looking for three pilot sites this year that would be part of training, um, part of setting some standards or taking standards that have been used in other sites and adjusting them to what makes sense for schools in this part of the country and so forth. Um, and that I would see that, as I understand the time frame, and Nancy, correct me if I'm wrong, but that would be a process going on this year. The visit might be later in the spring, or are they talking about next fall? They're looking to make selection of the three schools where they would pilot the pilot the initiative in the spring and to do the quality review of these three schools this spring. This spring, It's right. an ongoing five-year project. hardest things, uh, and it is, certainly shows up in any accreditation process, is making sure that the people who are actually doing the visiting are well trained. Um, as it is now, our accreditations are three-day visits. They are people who are recommended, who are good, considered uh, certainly very competent professionals in their own school buildings. That's the process we use. Uh, but unless there's something I'm missing, I don't think there's any real training to do that. Uh, I, I'm not, a, Rick, are you aware of any that people <clears throat> undergo? I'm not, and I've been on a few of them. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's, it's based on your, you know, you're walking in the door with your own experience and your own perception. What makes this process a little different is that there is a process by which people are setting standards and the people coming in get some training, some, and then they're part of that discussion too. Because this certainly is sensitive work. How do you how do you invite people in who are both honest observers um, and uh, compassionate, uh, understanding, and fully credible observers? Uh, so that's, you know, that's, we're setting a higher standard of observation and evaluation than is often the case. It would not be an evaluative process of individual teachers. It would be an issue of whether, you know, the focus would be on the student as learner. Um, and so often what we get plagued with is that we talk about what we hope will happen, but we don't have real good assessments of what, in fact, children are actually learning, or our hopes actually being played out in what's going on. That's the intent of a program like this. Yeah. Uh, do you see, um, wh when I first read this, I, I was thinking if I were a teacher in the Pancover Middle School with all the disruption that's happening right now, that 
uh, this might be pretty hard to have happen. How, how do you feel about that? I feel about it the way I think there's a revolution going on and should be going on in our thinking about a lot of our institutions. So we don't, I don't think evaluation or investigation is something you wait until you feel real good about what you're doing. I think it's part of setting the standards about what it is we want to accomplish. That um, that's, a, that's a real revolution in our thinking. It's, I mean, it's in part of the total quality process is defining the problem, gathering data, understanding what is, what is now, just honestly what is now, and setting that as the systemic basis for continuous improvement. Because it really is a continuous improvement that, that we're after, you know, wherever we may be right now. It's not as if you call somebody in to give you a blue ribbon and say that you are, in fact, the best or what have you. Um, because if that's what the, what the purpose is, my, my concern would be is that we tend to put our best foot forward. What we really want to find out is where we are. Uh, where we are, I think, is very good. But it's not perfect. Nobody is. Therefore, that's the sense I have of that. But having worked now for three years with different groups on total quality issues, I agree with you that that may in fact seem threatening and it's not my intention nor I know it's not the intention of the university to come through um, like a school for excellence. Do you make it or not? You know, it's a very different process from getting the blue ribbon school for excellence kind of process where you have to prove that you have certain, you meet certain criteria. This is simply uh, asking questions to find out where are we? Different kind of... And, and the thing mm -hmm. is, I think we're doing a lot of pieces of this already. And what I think it would do is give us an overall process to look at the school as a whole, not just look at you know, the language arts here or the math here or this or that or the other thing, but give us a, a more holistic sense. And I, I certainly don't think this seems like a threatening presentation, but more of a factual thing. We've, got, we've really got to be able to concentrate on just getting the facts um, you know, without people feeling threatened. Um, well, I was um, recently in La Pond Cove in, in middle school, and the teachers are doing a remarkable job adapting oh, under a situation that's evolving, and they're looking forward to moves and disruption in their curriculum and just making do with what is. Um, how, how do they feel about this? Have they been asked? This, we have just really basically had some early conversation. So let's, um, Nancy, you want to respond to that? Well, just we had a faculty meeting today, and it's rare that we have those. So um, that's nice that I could go on television and announce that we had one. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that opportunity. <clears throat> um, the other thing is, for the last several years, the team leadership in the middle school, and it has been a revolving team leadership, so it's not always the same people. We've been asking ourselves this question about having someone come in from the outside and give us a view of ourselves with another set of eyes. And we've had trouble finding anyone that we thought would really do a good job. The people that we've looked at from that come and do an accreditation kind of thing like they do at the high school are very oriented to secondary approaches. And then the New England League of Middle Schools has a group that will come and do that for you. And that very, very much depends on who's in your group as to the quality of feedback that you get. But none of them hang around and stick with you after they've made the suggestions or given you some feedback and have that continuing conversation that Nancy mentioned. So today at our faculty meeting, we didn't take a vote. Um, we didn't take a show of hands in any way at all. But we've been talking about as we move to this new physical space, we also can figure out what practices do we want to take with us? What pieces of our curriculum do we want to take with us? And it's a question we've been asking ourselves for the last two or three years. As Ann said, in many of our curriculum areas, we've been doing some of these things. This, we see this sort of as a way to kind of pull some of it together. And I don't want to stand here and tell you everyone jumped up and down and said, this is great, let's get involved in a project. But everyone sort of, yeah, that kind of makes sense. And at a middle school, that's excitement, by the way. So um, I don't want you to misread that. And they know that we are sort of in a different physical plant this year, but we'll be in an even different one in two years. And we want to be sure that we really go there 
with the best of our practices and then work on the ones that we really want to improve and make sure that when we spend time to improve things, we're improving the ones that really need improvement and not reworking the same ones that seem to be working. So we're excited about it. I would say that um, you know, it's only going to be three schools this year. And my experience with the Southern Maine Partnership has been terrific, but we might come on board with this the second year by showing our interest this year. Um, if we aren't one of the three schools this year, we are still uh, privy to the, some of the conversations and presentations, and it wouldn't be bad to do it the second year, but I think we're also as ready as we're going to be to go ahead and go to the meeting on November 7th, I believe the meeting is, is that right, Nancy, where we'll send um, myself and two, parent, two teachers and a parent will attend that meeting and find out some more information, and I know Pond Cove's going to do the same thing. So I think it's a, it's a fair question, Gail, and I also worry about how much we're going to ask them to do, but um, we don't want to just sit and worry about the fact that you know, some of our best windows got boarded up over the weekend and now we get to look at a lot of plywood. Um, we need to also keep looking at new ideas and mm -hmm. new things um, to keep us involved in what's happening. Thanks, Nancy. Beth? Um, I just wanted to really um, highly recommend that you do do this. Um, we are looking at maintenance in terms of a five-year plan. Um, and I really think we need to look at what we're doing in the schools, the teaching and the learning in terms of a five-year plan, and it should be a continual improvement. And, and I think it would be wonderful to get on board. We're always asking for data, and this would be a great way to collect a baseline and really work forward. Carla? Um, you mentioned that this process has been used in New York State. Mm -hmm. Have you gotten, or has anyone gotten any specific feedback from a New York school that has done this? No, I, this is in, we're just entering the process now. I'm sure that at some point that will occur. It's part of the ongoing meetings, no doubt. Uh, and there's a quote from uh, Commissioner <coughs> Sobel in here, but it, um, other than that, I, I don't have any specific information. I think th this is not a done deal. I think what no, no. Connie's looking for is just, uh, you know, some consensus that we think it's, it's worth pursuing. Charlie? There are a couple of things that kind of piqued my interest, mainly because there are things we've talked about, especially the last four years since Connie's been here. And one of them was the postscript on page 21. And it really was the second paragraph. And it talked about involving teachers and school staff in systemic and sustained professional uh, process and a professional appraisal of objectives and methods and results. And it should be ongoing, that you should review what works and what doesn't and what should be done differently. And, and the collaborative, the collaborative, mm -hmm. that really stood out. Mm -hmm. And we've been mm -hmm. talking about getting teachers to work collaboratively together and not solitary. And it, it states, the day of the lonely teacher isolated in his or her classroom, deprived of interaction with other adults, is anachronism. Like all other prof professionals, teachers need to share their experience reflect on it and learn from one another. And it's learning from one another and sharing. And when you look at accountability, and we as a board the last couple of years have talked about accountability, and the cornerstones for, for accountability are having learning standards, having standards of practice, and having standards of delivery. We talk about inequity between classrooms and teachers, and the only way you're going to do that is to get them to work together as, as, as a collaborative team, giving them the time, and I think we've been trying to do that. I, I mean, we've, we've allowed in the, even the elementary of a common planning time. We've got to show these, t show these teachers and lead them through how to effect, more effectively use that time to achieve what we're looking for and, and it's a better delivered system where, where students actually take the initiative to learn and the teacher becomes more of a guide through that process. I also think that there are, um, there's, there's really some brilliant teaching going on in our system. I mean, there is, um, it's just, you know, you just kind of drop into a classroom. Uh, you'd be blown away by some of the conversations that are going on, some of the uh, activities. I think that probably one of the things that we do least well is communicate that clearly to our our parent group. I mean, it seems like sometimes we do focus on the problems. And I think that uh, that's another thing, however, that could happen. I mean, that, that some of that can be raised to the surface, tied together, 
and recognized as um, not just as an individual solution to a problem, but that in fact there there is some continuous improvement, et cetera. So I do not see uh, any of this is necessarily threatening or negative, but it has certainly been my experience that trying to get people's thinking on the difference between looking for baseline data and um, and the kind of process where you try to get earn a gold ribbon uh, is really there really is a revolution in thinking there, mm -hmm. and organizational improvement is going to come about when we can get ourselves from one mindset to the other. Um, so that's why I'm. Would, would like to at least move forward in the conversation. Um, I wanted to address a couple of things that were said, said previously. Uh, one, to um, elaborate on where the elementary teachers are. Uh, like the uh, likewise in the elementary, people are not exactly jumping up and down and saying let's approach another, you know, another uh, assignment here. However, in looking at this and in hearing David Green speak, He's absolutely electrifying. He knows his stuff. He is a teacher's teacher. He works well with people, and that comes across very clearly when he meets and when he speaks with, with, a, with an audience or when he would come to the community and talk with us, should we be selected as a site. The piece um, for us in Pond Cove, our team leaders, uh, we shared this information, Wayne and I, with team leaders last week. Responses to um, the material we're very few because it's new to people. It's a new initiative. They're not familiar with what is happening. We're still at the beginning stages of hearing what it might be, do and what it might promise for us. Um, as Nancy said on November 7th, we hope to bring some folks to hear more and to explore what the potential might be. The other piece is schools in New York. At the meeting uh, two weeks ago, I did ask if um, any of the Southern Maine Partnership folks had spoken with specific schools in New York to do a follow-up. It is somewhat different because this is an initiative that was statewide. However, we could certainly be in contact with specific schools there and talk with them about their experiences prior to undertaking anything should we be selected. Uh, one response that David gave that I thought was, was absolutely wonderful, he said that they had um, gone into an elementary school in Upper New York, he said a fairly affluent community um, that was rated very high and we had a great deal of respect, uh, commend, they were very, you know, their programs were commendable. What happened in that school, and I'm not saying that that's basically what's, what happens in our community, but in that school, uh, the community, the, the staff, were somewhat complacent because the youngsters had been doing well and the standards seemed to be high, but the learning that went on from the initiative was incredible. And the staff was as moved as were the community members when they really began to talk together about what was happening in regard to teaching and learning. So I don't know if that, that would be a positive uh, outcome for us but it's certainly a consideration, and that was the way that he responded to the question. He said, well, he felt that there would certainly be benefits for our community under that, those circumstances. So in regard to as where our faculty is, I don't know as of the, at this point, but I would suspect that like the middle school, they'll be equally as enthused once they begin to understand what the whole process involves. I think this is an ideal time. I mean, I think that as we look at the physical plant and the new possibilities and just a, a new way of looking at, at that, this will be a new way of looking at our teaching and it's a good way of supporting teachers as practitioners. Yeah, I think it gives us a structure. Right now we're heaping requests on administrators for data about this, data about that, and it's all it's all kind of fragmented and it's I think it's probably hard for the administrators and the teachers to say, what on earth do we really want? I mean this gives us a some kind of structure to go forward. I think what we all want is to know where we stand and you know where we need improvement and this gives us a, a formal structure for doing that, a very positive structure I think, rather than you know this piecemeal approach. Um, we've used up till this point. So it, it does. Positive. It does and it, Charlie makes a good point that it sets some of the standards mm -hmm. for establishing the standards. A collaborative model, for example, uh, 
which is in many ways a centerpiece of much of what we're doing. And we see this uh, almost every single day. But what's nice about this proposal is that you get another set of eyes to tell us if our eyes are accurate in those perceptions. I'm used to this process because in special ed we're the only component in public education nationally which is reviewed at an incredibly comprehensive level every third year. And uh, right down to the point of an individual's, individual child's plan, not just the great scope of what special ed is, but an individual child's plan. And this kind of promise makes a lot of sense in terms of a great deal of what we've been doing for several years now. I think it's cumbersome in terms of the physical logistics to be clear on that point. But I think we're looking at the inside of those walls and I think that's what makes the difference here. The other thing about this that is very encouraging and Nancy uh, speaks to this well, it is a longer term process than the average evaluation component which comes along, tells you what its uh, commendations are, what its recommendations are, and leaves you for 10 years. That's not all that helpful. Mm -hmm. And that's, those are the promises of this as I see it, and I think those are the things that help uh, us make some um, decisions about this. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. Okay, well, I will let you know and I will uh, help if you just jotting down um, dates. I'm tentatively going with a November 3rd, Thursday afternoon from 3.30 to 5.30 for a meeting for the Quality Council. I am trying to get David Silvanil from USM to come then to who is one of the people that's involved with this project, was in England for a while and is, I believe, one of the people that's actually brought it back, made the recommendation to bring it back. So I will send out a notice if I'm successful in nailing that date down. And that's my, uh, I did, it, by the way, include uh, a piece of information just to follow up the, col the total quality issue. You have a little study here, parent conference study, fifth grade. Last year, uh, we did a number of total, small total quality projects. This was what the fifth grade did. Uh, they sent out a, a survey to get some data and they have uh, collected some of it here. There was really quite a lot more information in the total process and rather than take the time tonight to go through it, since you haven't had a chance to read this, I'll just give it to you under, uh, for, again, for those of you who haven't been listening to these terms before. I, hate to, I don't want it to sound like a buzzword, but the quality initiatives. Um, it does sound like a buzzword, can't help it. Um, anyway, I hope you will read that. We'd be happy to discuss it at more. Okay, moving on to the next item, school board subcommittees and reports. The first is finance subcommittee, Charlie. Uh, we met this evening at six o'clock, a half an hour early to allow for a workshop. Uh, we met and um, reviewed and signed the warrants. Um, discussed and approved a copier lease for the middle school. And Roger Kelly from our, our law firm came and did a presentation on um, negotiations. And uh, we adjourned. Well, since everybody was there, I guess there are no questions. So moving on to the school building committee. Funny. I can't remember if we've, we had a meeting since our last September board meeting. We've yeah. had these colors. That's We're right, we did. We are choosing <laughs> oh, yes, right. and some other things. Yeah. That's right, we did have some other issues come up. Um, basically, and Sue is here to do, if you have some specific questions to ask on day to day operations, I'm amazed at how smoothly things are going. I, I know that that smooth is a relative term, that every day in both Pine Cove and in the middle school there are issues that crop up, but again, the, the teaming that we've managed to establish here seems to be working. Um, all you have to do, of course, is look out the window and you can see uh, from either building pretty much what the progress is being made. Um, we are anxiously waiting some confirmation of schedule. We, um, just to remind people, we, are, uh, we expect, I'm gonna put that in quotes, underlined, expect, uh, 
to be moving um, much upon Cove into the refurbished Lunt building. However, uh, I just want to be realistic about things. Um, we are, um, our requisition meeting will be a week from this Thursday, and we will be getting an update on the schedule then. Um, things do seem to be moving along. Um, we've been through the buildings and kind of asked people. We have a few rooms that do get impacted by noise, particularly when, as has been the case in the last few weeks, been pouring a lot of concrete. Those concrete trucks are just flat out noisy. Uh, we're doing the best we can to mitigate some of that. The dust seems to have pretty well taken care of itself what with rain and some of the procedures that we've used. Um, other than that, I think that's the, the one thing I've got my fingers crossed on getting through this year. We still have a year to get through with the heating system we've got, in, particularly in the middle school, and it is it is on a wing and a prayer. You know those old movies about the plane that didn't quite make it back? That's all I can think of with that particular system. The boilies are fun. It's every radiator. It's all the little parts that, in many cases, you can't even buy replacements for anymore, and they keep breaking down. We turned the heat on, of course, for hot water, and we had some surprises and some leaks and some emergencies to deal with. So let's just hope. I, d I just want to say um, I continue to hear nothing but really positive things from parents about how smoothly things are going. And I have to, again, commend all the staff um, for keeping things on an even keel for the kids. I know sometimes it's not easy, so it is appreciated. Um, since Gail's mentioned the colors, um, <laughs> we have had this little subcommittee of the building committee that has been meeting with the architect and the interior designer, um, I think I mentioned this at the last meeting, um, to pick the interior colors. And boy, I'll tell you, that's quite a, quite a project. Um, so far, I think we've decided on um, the Pond Cove colors uh, where we've made some headway on the middle school and on some of the common spaces, the cafeteria, auditorium space. Um, there's still some work to be done. And I'm thinking maybe if we're if we've gone through this process by our November meeting, maybe we could have some kind of you know the drawings or something that we could bring here and just present to people, mm -hmm. um, just so that they can see, so they won't be too shocked when they see them <laughs> in real life. But I think I think. I think it'll be a good, a good result. It's always hard to tell when you're working with little tiny tiles this big and trying to extrapolate what they'll look like in a, in a huge space. You, you feel a little nervous. But it's, it's ironic. The, the Pond Cove planning took place in one of the portables. And we have moved, now that we're into the middle school, we've moved to Susie Terrian's art room, and which I think gives you a little better feel of being in the building and in our last meeting, we actually moved into the hallway, which is actually where you should be looking when you're looking at the hall colors and floor colors. But we did present to the building committee as a whole the elementary school proposal, and it was voted and accepted with very little comment. So I think they appreciate the process also. I think so. We should also probably mention, since we are in Susie Tarian's room, what an incredible job she has done with her students and the amazing artwork that has come out of a, a huge dirt and rock pile that's right outside <laughs> the yeah. art room. It is, an, it is incredible, the, um, the work that these kids have done. And I think she's working on doing some kind of display of it. So even these ugly, um, ugly piles of dirt can turn into something quite lovely. So. Any other comments, questions about the building? It's hard to think that the Lunt building is going to be done by the end of December. It oh. looks like a new building going up once they removed yeah. everything yeah. but the structure. That's encouraging. Well, that's why I say, you know, you really have to be reasonable. We'll see. OK, moving on to the policy subcommittee, Beth. Uh, the policy subcommittee met on Wednesday, September 27th at 9.30 in the superintendent's conference room. Um, we went over many of the high school policies, which we will be presenting for a first reading tonight. And um, we will meet again on Wednesday, October 26th at 9.30 
um, in the superintendent's conference room again, I think, or Connie's office. Um, and we will, we will be looking at a lot of the special ed policies. And it's mostly to bring all these policies up to date and have them reviewed. Um, and I think then I just go on to go right on to unfinished <laughs> business. <laughs> Policy second. Go right um, on. I'll hopefully uh, read all these in the right order. But under unfinished business, we need to do the second reading of the policies, um, IGBI, Foreign Exchange Student Program, IGD, Co-Curricular and Extracurricular Programs, JFCC, Student Conduct on Buses, JFCCR, Student Conduct on the Bus, Administrative Guideline Number 18, Policy JO, Student Education Records Policy, Policy AFCB teacher evaluation, policy BDDC agenda preparation and dissemination, and policy BF board policy development. Those would all be for a second reading. Okay, are there any comments on any of these policies? There weren't any on the first reading, so. <laughs> There was some. I just had um, a couple of typos on JFCC, student conduct on school buses. Um, on this second line, privilege, there's an extra letter in it. And um, we need an apostrophe on parents on the first line of the second paragraph. Anything to say. Just, just one observation. Some of these policies are very short. Yeah. Is there any way you could ever consolidate them? Um, there. In the audit, that. the original audit, what happens, the reason I think that that occurs is that uh, the audit by MSMA is done against a list of recommended policies, and in some cases they're not just recommended, they're also required by state law. So I couldn't tell you off the top of my head whether that's the case for all of them. It probably isn't. But in some cases, we've also been advised to leave the general statement for policy and remove some of the specifics for uh, administrative issues or in like the foreign exchange student program. By the time we got through the reading things from the policy that was extant uh, that are no longer true, it was a short policy, and we just didn't. We thought that was sufficient. But those, all of the above, are reasons why some of them were short. Well, I think it's because in that particular one, there's a cross reference to JECBA admission of exchange students, and that's all been consolidated into yes. one policy. That's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is in a better form than it was when I first came on the board. So. Yeah. And, and the policies are generally shorter, which I think is best way to go. It leaves less room for misunderstanding and we certainly have had plenty of misunderstandings about the original intent of some of the policies. Entertain a motion. I, no I will make a say. I'll make a motion. Would you like me to read all those policies again or could I make a motion that we accept all the policies that I just read for, second. for the second reading um, that we approve them tonight? I second that. Any discussion? All in favor? 7-0. Uh, the next piece of business for the policy committee would be um, policies that we reviewed and accepted as they are at the policy subcommittee meeting. And those are policy JFCI, student policy on alcohol, tobacco, and other drug abuse, policy JFD, students of legal age. Any discussion? I would like to make a motion that we um, accept policies JFCI and JFD as reviewed by the policy subcommittee. Second that. Any discussion? All in favor? Seven zero. <laughs> we can go on to new business with um, policies for a first reading tonight. 
Um, the policies for a first reading are policy IGDJ R1, which is athletic rules and regulations. Previously, it was IGDJ R3, and it's the administrative guideline number 16. Policy ID. IGDJR2, which is an athletic policy. Policy IKDR, which is an honor roll administrative guideline. Policy IKF, which is graduation requirements. Policy JECE, student withdrawal from school. And policy JEFC, early dismissal for high school seniors. Keith? I was wondering um, about athletic rules and regulations, what the rationale was on uh, point number nine. Athletes suspended from school are allowed to practice but may not participate. We discussed that um, at the policy committee meeting and basically we were trying to be consistent with the new drug use policy um, at the high school and middle, I mean the whole new school policy and that is currently what happens and we did discuss that quite a bit and that was what we sort of came to agreement on with, with Rick and the committee. And was there some of the discussion on that point related to also that if um, someone is suspended from school, if they're at practice then they're in a place and doing something constructive rather than sitting at home playing Nintendo at that time or whatever. And they're still not allowed to participate in an actual game. Any other comments, questions? On any of them? Or on no, that one? On any of them. First one? Or, uh, Excuse me? Do I just review them one at a time? Do you guys feel the need to review them one at a time? Or yeah. Or yeah. <laughs> From that meeting, that needs to be clarified, that number nine, I'm glad you brought it up, that if, the, if a player is suspended from the team due to a violation, they, they practice with the team, we need to clarify this better. If they're suspended from school that day or for two days, they cannot participate in any school activity, let alone athletics. So that needs to be clarified. I'm glad okay. you brought it up. Okay, if they're on a team that then has been suspended for some violation, they still go to practice and participate as part of the uh, of the part of the program, but cannot play any game. So if they're suspended from school that day, they cannot participate. Okay. So this is not correct. That's, no, that's... No. Yeah, that's so it shouldn't say suspension. suspended from the... Right, yeah. see, I, rather than team suspension or activity suspension, okay. okay. Okay, do you want to go through these one yeah. by one then? Yep. You circled define season. Was somebody questioning that terminology? I, I circled that on my copy, and these are the ones that then got reproduced. I just had asked, asked a question on that at the committee meeting. It wasn't circled for the whole board's information. <laughs> well, what, what you're proposing to delete at the bottom? Athletes, when they are a member of a school-sponsored team in a given sport season, cannot participate in any organized competitive activity as mentioned above during that season, means they're allowed, like if they're on the basketball team, they can ski and that kind of stuff. I think it was left, and I think, I don't know if it's exactly above or somewhere else, that they can get permission from the athletic director and there is a way that they can participate uh, in. I think it's number five. Uh, yeah. yeah. And number 10. Yeah. We definitely discussed that also. I, I have a concern because it precludes a lot of students from doing some, you know, extracurricular kind of activities during a sports season, and it's like they're hindered. Like if they're on the basketball team, they're not allowed to ski or do something that could hinder their right. participation, I, I, and I have a problem with that. I think the primary concern of that is, is, and I'll give you an example, Charlie, is indoor soccer. If a student is swimming during the winter season of playing basketball, it's really the discretion of the athletic director and the coach of that team to, to allow a student to participate in a 
not, not a family function or, or an activity of recreation, but on an organized team that participates throughout the school year. And that's when we talked about a defiant season. So within a basket, say within the winter season, it really is the discretion of the coach and athletic director to, whether a student can participate in another sport, say, so to speak. And indoor soccer, I, I would tell you, is, the, is pretty much the, uh, uh, the prime example of that. And we've had students who have actually been injured during an indoor soccer activity to, that have missed baseball season, and in another case, uh, softball, because they were injured. And, but in both cases, the coaches had granted permission of the student to participate. So it gives the, the coach of a, a sport a little more leverage as far as whether they want kids participating. And it allows the student to at least face up to the coach saying, I'm playing on Sundays indoor soccer. Is that OK? Rather than a student walking in on crutches Monday morning when, with, no, uh, with the coach not having any idea of that. So, with, so this is specifically for any athletic policy or any athletic activity, whether it's in the middle school or high school. Uh, we have Because I know that there, there, we have organized sports within the middle school, but there are a lot of travel teams out there that are beyond the scope of the school. Do these students get permission from their, from their appropriate coaches? Uh, I mean, there's a chance of injury there, too. I don't think we even have that one. we play and we don't have championships um, we're doing things we're really sort of just offering an opportunity to play so we don't get involved in what their weekend activities are kids usually talk with their coaches about what they're doing but it's not a formal procedure at this time it's certainly something if you wanted us to look at it we'd be glad to look at it but at this time it's not as a formal procedure as it is in the high school but there, my concern is that there, there are students in the middle school playing dual sports without the knowledge of... Okay. I think I, I would say they are playing dual sports. In most cases, the coaches know about that. Okay. But we don't have that formal procedure for the permission. Okay. I want to go back to that point. So what this is saying is if you're a student and you choose to play basketball, you can't swim or you can't do whatever. On an, organ on an organized team, not you can't go swimming with your family. Right. Without the coach, no. But, well, I mean, they're saying you can't participate in two sports, even with a coach, no. And I'm not talking about playing off with your family. If you wanted to play basketball and you wanted to swim, you can't do that. Be awfully hard to do just from a time yeah, commitment. I understand that, but it would, well, I think that's strange. It'd be hard to do your homework. The only thing, I, with the high participation rate of, of students in our athletic program, and with the growing number of students going into the high school and those numbers growing, the opportunities for students to participate are going to be limited by the number of students that can be on a team. So I think this policy probably would serve a purpose in, in allowing more opportunities for more students. And that's going, you know, it hasn't, it's, it hasn't been a problem in the past, but it's going to be as the enrollment increases. So I think I hear, a, you know, I hear a lot about out of district students that go to school here who participate, you know, in a lot of our activities, which, you know, should be a right of their attending our schools, but there's a lot of resentment, and there'll be more resentment when students who live in this community are not a are able to or, or are precluded from participating because they don't have the athletic ability that maybe an out-of-district student might. So I think we're going to hear more and more of that in the, in the years to come, especially with the high participation rate. So future board members, beware. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, are we done with the <laughs> athletic season? This is short. Honor roll. Any comments? Questions? Charlie? I had, I had a concern. 
there was at one time discussion in the middle school, because this has to do with 6 through 12, about these being more core courses, that, and that there was some concern about courses that precluded students from getting on either high honors or honors because they weren't um, full full year courses, they weren't, they weren't courses. core courses, et cetera. Right. What we shared with the um, policy committee meeting, at, what we shared at that subcommittee meeting in September is just a statement of what is, and this is the statement that's off our current report card. It's the statement we've been operating under for the last two or three years. Um, it certainly was not in alignment with the old policy, but this is a statement of current practice. Um, it certainly doesn't mean that it has to be the absolute pra practice, but it is the current practice of what we do. And we have come to that dilemma many times about what we count and what we don't count. And we have had that discussion. We can almost have that discussion at any time or moment in the middle school with lots of energy around it at any time. One thing we have moved to this year, if you remember, um, we are on a trimester, so everything will be done at the same time. That will help eliminate some of the confusion um, that we've had the last couple of years, and especially last year, um, and helping people see that everything is given a letter grade at the same time. We're also talking with um, some of the teachers in our allied arts block, which is our block that quite honestly is the one that people question at times how that should be done. And we're talking with people, you have people on that team that they see people differently. The music teachers see everybody once every six days for the entire year. Phys Ed sees people two times um, in every six day rotation for the entire year. But art, computer, technology see people for three days in one of the trimester six day rotations. So those courses will have weight for one trimester but not the others. And some of our students do better in some of those subjects than other ones. In the fifth grade, they do not take technology, but they take library instead. It has in the past not been a graded subject for the fifth graders uh, because it didn't have, it comes, they do library for two days a week and it's really getting to know the middle school library and using it. And then they also have a health curriculum um, for that. So those are things that we continue to visit and go back. Our fifth grade doesn't participate in the honor roll though, so it doesn't usually become as critical a question for them. Um, it's something we'll be glad to go back and talk again, but as we presented it to the subcommittee in September, this is really a statement of what is right now in current practice. Can I just comment on the on IKDR? Um, we seem to have still some inconsistency here. I mean, our, we've crossed out high school at the top, and then we talk about the high school all the way through, and I mm -hmm. think we need to um, to clarify what we're doing here. I think the intention was to make it the um, school honor roll as at the top, and that it should be middle and high school pretty much uh, throughout. Well, I think we, we better clarify that that's really the case. I mean, where we're talking about the evening of excellence and we could just drop all that, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, I don't say, think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it could be just dropped. I know this is a first reading, but this is this is a this grading concern is a thing that has been on on the board's agenda and in the community for quite a bit. There's been a lot of discussion. I would like to see this particular policy tabled until we have some kind of a workshop to work it out. Um, we have things to work out as far as weighted grades and all that kind of thing. That, that's right, but Charlie, right now, this is, a, this is an administrative guideline. This is what's an actual practice. Okay, but, you're, but it, you're, you are gonna make changes to it, and I, I really wouldn't wanna make any changes until we review the whole. But, well, the information is so incorrect and what we have now, at least this would be correct information about what currently exists. Okay. My concern is that we will correct it and then we will move on to something else. Actually, actually um, the Get policy com committee is looking at the issue of weighted grades and it's been, at the moment, it's been delegated to Gail and the, it's in the But I have, but even the grading system itself, where we got these figures for the appropriate grade, you know, you know, I'd like to see what, what practice is out there. You know, are we, 
Colorado is stuck with. We, what, we did discuss that at the policy. Do what? Because a lot of our kids do go on to university. We, we did discuss that in using the um, 60 to 100 scale and the, you know, I mean, the 10 point span is, and we. I think agreed at this time that it would take a lot of looking into, but we were wanted to get at least the information in the policy book correct for what we do now, and not to say we were never going to have those discussions, that we were actually really looking at the weighted grade situation carefully this year, but there are just so many policies that are so far from common practice that it was important to just at least have what we do there. Okay. I would just kind of like to share um, Charlie's concern that as we review the um, weighted grades, which we're going to, that we do also look at the, um, system, the number system that we have. Okay. Okay, moving on to graduation requirements. Any comments? Questions? Under senior project. These were lifted from the handbook at the high school, which is why we have sort of things in there that don't really maybe okay. apply just for your information. Okay. Because <laughs> it now it is in practice, and that's. It, we were just trying to get the graduation requirements that we currently have, and they came right out of the pages. I think Rick pulled them out of the pages of the handbook, and those were the things that fell on the same page. Okay. That we then needed to take the only out. The thing was to add that sentence from the bottom of graduation and senior banquet to the end of the uh, graduation requirement. Okay. That's since that makes sense with the, the flow of the. Any other comments, questions? Moving on to uh, positive action committee. just speak from personal experience and say this this committee does actually exist and it works it does a good job I think. early dismissal for high school seniors why are we uh, crossing out must must be receiving at least a C why think, are we not putting any kind of academic? I think Rick spoke to that, that this was what current practice was, that the, they had removed the, um, the grade requirement, and um, that he felt that that was a fair way to do it and an appropriate senior privilege. Mm -hmm. And this is what the practice is and has been. And the control to manage the whole issue, that it was too difficult to police every door, every senior. But uh, as far as, no, I'm talking about the, about the, the uh, putting a grade restriction on their eligibility for early dismissal. That's a lot of concern. Rick, wasn't the thinking that um, it's more controlled by C, whether, uh, whether a person was going to make their graduation requirements was more the, uh, the controlling factor? seniors, especially in their senior year, not taking a particular course if it jeopardized them losing uh, early dismissal or late arrival. In other words, we would want them to pursue taking a course. Uh, if they were doing poorly at the end of the quarter to drop that class, that, that was not our intent of this policy. Okay, and that, that was part of the thinking that, <coughs> excuse me, that, that, that grades should not be put uh, as a uh, concern of that. As long as the student is at, you know, has the number of credits toward graduation uh, and is on in, in line to graduate, that, that that was not a problem. It goes back. To, I, I have. It goes back to the issue of students, of uh, students. Um, we're going to put it kind of downsizing, not you know, kind of laying laying low, not. 
being academically um, active, and then they, and, and with the majority of students that go on to post-secondary education, it's kind of a false, you know, a false um, period of their time. And I, and I, you know, I, I don't know. I have a problem with this whole okay. In lieu of this, this whole issue of early dismissal for high school seniors as as a reward for for having achieved it's it's defeating the whole purpose of why they're in school of rewarding them for for three years of academic excellence and then saying well you don't have to work hard I, it bothers me i know what i know it's in place and it's it's one of those historical things but it just bothers me I, I agree with you. I mean, I think that is a discussion we need to continue to have with the, how we <coughs> seniors a, a feeling of having made it or whatever. But I, I, I certainly see your point that, you know, just giving them license not to come into school is not necessarily the message we want to send, right. especially. I, I think this, we also need to look at this in light and talk with the students about the issue of the, the drug abuse issue um, and how, you know, how this might be related to it in the time out of school and how to use time constructively. <clears throat> but I, you know, I think that's good. What percentage do you think of the senior class you utilize this? Depending on their schedule um, on a given day, maybe 20 to 30 percent, if that. To give you a historical perspective on this, um, a number of years, when I first arrived at the high school, which was 10 years ago, students could only be given freeze or uh, senior privileges if they received, uh, I believe it was a C or better or, or honors or better. And what, what was happening is students were dropping classes. So when you, like one of the things we are, hopefully we'll be adding next year, will be a senior uh, requirement in, in social studies. That will be a, a senior requirement. So I mean, we're looking in other avenues to enhance that. I, I agree with you as far as the senior year in, in, ca in the case of students kind of seeing that as a, uh, a time when they're starting to look toward college and, and, and that sort of thing. But we're trying to enhance it by offering courses that, that, are, that are going to be uh, accountable to the students and also a requirement of them uh, as seniors as opposed to saying uh, you need to be passing this grade. I don't want students not taking a class because the possibility of getting out at 1 o'clock one day every four is more important to them than, than perhaps well, Sometimes it's two out of a... Sometimes it is. Which yeah. I think a, a majority of... And I would rather see that time utilized towards a service project or something. Yeah. And you're talking two hours. You're talking about 50 minutes. Yeah. Now you have to realize that some of these seniors use that time if they're in the Big Buddy program or utilizing it. So it's not necessarily to leave school and, and not to, in some cases, use some social service. but but. Uh, uh, we, we plan the, um, the Big Buddy program, which has about 40 seniors involved, to do it during their free period and in downtime that they're not taking a class. A lot of them utilize that, that time either early morning or in the afternoon to go to the middle school and work with the kids. So I don't want you to get the feeling that every student that has that privilege, at, you know, those 20 students on an average a day, necessarily <coughs> leaves. For some, they leave, and for some, it, it's probably the best thing. Uh, I'll be real honest with you, to have seniors hanging around for two hours when they have no classes. Well, I'd rather see some kind of alternative for right. the use of a free. You're not going to take a course, so therefore you have to participate in some kind of community service project. That's where I'd like to see the board go with, we need, we really with need students to utilizing that. free time. Yeah. We, we definitely discussed the free time issue, and we especially discussed it around large blocks of free time in the middle of the day. I mean, it was definitely a concern of you know, the committee. Um, and, uh, and, and I can tell you as a parent, we're going through this right now. So. Yeah. <laughs> but Charlie, the, the receiving a C no, I can I can see that purpose. I would like to see somehow as a board initiative to to look at alternatives for using free time other than early yeah. or early or late arrival as a privilege of having attained your credits for graduation. I think it's a wrong message for students in their senior year to be, be getting that, I, no, I can take a break. Well, you're not in a point in your life, the majority of students in this community, is they going to go on to post-secondary education when you have 80% of them? You know, it's a wrong message for them to say, you know, you can take a, you can take a break, you've done well. But what's ahead of them? Rick, can I, can I just ask, um, are they, are the students who are affected by this closely, are they required to leave the grounds? Or, do you 
you have people no, they're not, they're, they're not parking lot, to leave so. us, but they sign once they sign out they're asked to stay until the end of school day some of them they may be athletes or involved in clubs and then at two o'clock they return to school so you do have a a number of kids who come back on campus. Uh, right, I don't have a problem with that. My, my problem is, do you have any kids who are, you know, signing out and then going out smoking in the parking lot, or do they actually, are they expected to leave the premises? They're expected, when they're, once okay. they sign out of the building, they're expected to leave the premises. Okay. Now that's not the same that one or two are not out. Some wait for other friends who, you know, they'll be outside waiting for a friend to get out at two. Um, <laughs> that's something we haven't really, uh, Remember, they're now in full view. <laughs> That's true. The parking lot is in. Good point. Good point. Thanks, Mark. Carl, I would just say a little bit of a flip side to what Charlie's saying. Um, if you have seniors and A is acceptable school conduct and C is meeting all the requirements, the flip side is saying, hey, we know you're responsible. And it's showing them that you know that they have some responsibility and that they'll use their time wisely. And you might disagree with that. <laughs> Parent only knows when they get an adolescent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've gone through these. I'll come back next month for a second reading. Um, do, oh, do we need a motion? No. 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 Okay. Just come back. Do we need to make a motion on the policies to delete from the policy books? I think we do. Um, yes. Oh, should I go practice ahead? Practice to vote on everything. So. Um, the policy subcommittee um, looked at the policies IG DJ R2, eating while on bus trips, IG DJ R3, athletic rules and regulations, and IKFA, participation in high school graduation exercises, which is now covered in policy. IKF and recommends that we mm -hmm. <laughs> delete those three. <laughs> okay. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Seven zero. I think that's it. Okay, I think we're finally through with that. Moving on to the other new business, um, personnel requests. And we have one nomination for a teaching staff. Remember, of course, that. Jackie Petrillo now is our assistant to the special ed director, and uh, obviously we were told you that we were looking for a replacement. We have one, Susan Prop. We included her resume in your packet, so you have some um, bird's eye view, at least, of her abilities. She has already started her duties, been in working with Jackie, as well as um, we've all had a chance to meet her and uh, wish her well. So I would nominate. Susan Prop to fill our um, rest of the year position, one year position in special education at the high school. Do I hear a motion? Sure, I'll make a motion. <laughs> I'd like to recommend that we accept the superintendent's nomination of Susan Prop as a new special ed teacher at the high school. A second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Zero. And nominations for athletic fee coaching. Okay, I'm just going to kind of zip right down through these. Seven and eighth grade B team soccer, Steve LaRose. Winter sports, varsity ice hockey, Brendan Hickey. Assistant ice hockey, Tim Holden. Freshman boys basketball, Tom Robinson. JV boys basketball, Kurt McCandless. JV girls basketball, Scott Shea. Girls swimming, Carrie Curtis, boys swimming. There's a little typo on that one. <laughs> Carrie Curtis, uh, assistant swimming, J.B. Whipple. And uh, additional co-curricular positions for 94-95 school year, middle school yearbook, Randy Perkins, and a change at the high school advisor from uh, Mr. Costello to Gail Edson and Dwight Ely sharing that position. Uh, we have some an unusual uh, situation here for the junior class advisor. Mr. DeFusco has volunteered to do that. I might point out that he has made a request that the stipends that usually go for these positions be no donated instead to the junior class treasury. I think you may be starting something there. You may find yourself um, uh, being recruited year after year, but <laughs> at any rate, um, more power to you. Policy debate, Hannah Ashley, 
and the literary magazine Bartleby Sarah Franklin. And your motion. I move we accept the recommendations for the athletic positions and the co curricular positions as stated by Dr. Goldman. Is there a second? Second that. Any discussion? Charlie? I was going to ask something about the junior advisor and then it, it just dawned on me. I have a junior and I was thinking back who his advisor was. Now I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Rick, I think it's awful good of you to take on this other job. I think the kids will appreciate it, too. Okay, all in favor? Seven zero. I didn't hear that. You might right. be opening up some uh, more stickers on graduation when that junior class graduates. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Wear a Teflon suit. Yes. <laughs> Oh, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So, so moved. <laughs> so seconded. Second. <laughs> All in favor?